better than your currency. Splurge your millions, buying houses like Monopoly. Fucking nine to five, man, the money is a joke to me. Buying cryptocurrency, my money in the privacy. I make it rain dollars, the watch me disappear. I'm so fly, man, I'm gonna need some men again. Hey guys and girls, welcome this week's episode of the No BS with Birchie podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Birchie. This is a show unraveling the truth to the facade of the 21st century. We're now X the Matrix and wake up the motherfucking reality. And uh, today I have a special guest here to, to talk about her journey and her story and her background of what she's been doing, which is really, really cool. Uh, you may have seen her in the news recently talking about her portfolio and how she's been able to use her knowledge uh, from her personal background of you know, studying law, understanding law, being a, a, an entrepreneur herself, to be able to build a, a nice property portfolio as well. So uh, today I have Monica Ravellis here. Thanks a lot for joining us, Monica. No worries. Pleasure to be here, Nathan. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, your, your story is really cool. Like, it's a lot of the young people out there saying it's hard to um, get started in the property market and hard to get a, a foot you know, in the door. And, um, you know, you've built a, a nice portfolio in only a short period of time and you've realized that there's ways to I'm always I'm always excited for new ways to outsmart the system outsmart the matrix and yeah you've you've uh, you've realized that you're structuring from a legal perspective and what you studied at law can help you you know get your way around the banks to, to yeah good position so good work with that <laughs> no 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 worries thanks yeah um, it, it's definitely a scary time when you first invest and along the ways you make mistakes you learn from it and for me yeah, structure has now played a big part in my strategy, especially moving forward. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And how long have you been investing for? Has it just been recently or? When, when I started you... about five years ago. That was when I first started. So I started quite late in yeah. my late 20s. Um, to be honest, I probably should have started probably 10 years earlier and not buy silly things like vehicles and take yeah. holidays and trips and things like that. Um yeah. Because looking back, I probably have, you know, 10 times more properties, but it is what it is. And I think it took me that time in life to kind of realise, actually, you know what, I'm sick and tired of working nine to five. I actually want passive income streams. And for me, property was something that really interested me. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And um, if you could, so if you could go back to your younger self, if you could go, you know, back 10 years ago, your, your biggest tip would be start early, would you think? Or yeah? Start early. As soon as you have the deposit, don't wait. Just yeah. go for it. Um, so, like, in my early 20s, I had a full-time job. I was earning about 70K a year at that point, um, working uh, at Sydney University. And instead of investing in my savings, I was still living at home with mum and dad, instead of, like, investing my savings, I yeah. went out and bought a car. I took holidays. I went out every weekend, you know, with mates and things like that and just really spoiling myself and enjoying life, um, yeah. focusing on the lifestyle rather than going, hang on a second, I don't really want to be working nine to five for the rest yeah. of my life and I'd rather, you know, use that money for something else. So that took me probably <laughs> almost a decade to kind of realise um, that there's a better way to generate income than just working nine to five. Yeah, awesome, awesome, man. So you, apart from studying law, like you're into music, yeah? I hear that yeah. you're into music. And, uh, yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I started off in music. So straight out of high school, I went and studied at the Sydney Conservatory of Music, um, and I specialised more in music production and electronic, um, basically, composition, which is, yeah, making music, like beats and shit like that, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I got offered in my last semester at uni a full-time job at the Sydney Conservatory of Music doing a sort of like a media production sort of role. Um, and then from there, I decided, actually, I really want to know about business and went off and did a MBA um, at the time. And then from the MBA, I realized, actually, really, I should be studying law because there's a lot of stuff out there that I still don't know, like contracts and IP and stuff to do with businesses. And at this point, I already had started my own teaching school um, and I've always been very entrepreneurial and I just wanted to either acquire or start up businesses and sell them off. So I was like, okay, well, I probably need to have that legal background. Yeah. And so it was whilst I was studying law, um, I went through, uh, I was dating someone at the time that ended not so well. And uh, after that breakup, I was like, I really, really just want to make money. And yeah. suddenly I had this urge of, I just want to save like crazy and have passive income streams. So 
I ended up buying a property. I went 50-50 with my brother at the time um, yeah. because at this point in time, I was no longer working full-time. I was doing a whole bunch of project um, contract-based roles. Um, so whilst I had the deposit and I could afford to pay the mortgage and there'll be $10,000 profit from that property by the end of the year, um, the only way I could actually get a loan from the bank was to go with someone who had full-time income, which was my brother. Yeah. So we bought a house for 350,000. Uh, I think that was end of 2016, I believe, or 2017. Yeah. And um, we bought it um, at the time we were told the rent was only going to be between 300 to 330 per week. I had a look at comparables in the area and realized I should be getting 450 per week in rent, but what I had to do was renovate. So we spent about 20k doing a cosmetic renovation, so just paint, new kitchen, that was pretty much it. We um, sanded because it had beautiful hardwood floors. We sanded and re-coated um, them, and that was it pretty much. And um, at the end of that, the we ended up getting um, the house revalued. It was now worth four twenty roughly, and the rent now was four fifty per week. Yeah, cool. So we've got equity, got cash flow. Um, uh, what, what, what? Like throughout your property journey so far, like what has been the most surprising thing that you've learned? Like if you had one thing you'd be like, wow, I didn't know this would start, would it be equity, would it be, what would be that? Yeah, I think um, initially I didn't realise what you could do with equity. And yeah. I think everyone kind of has that realisation. It's like, oh, wait, I can pull equity off my property and use that as a deposit for my next one, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so, and, and that's quite advantageous. And you've got a couple of ways to manipulate that equity. It's either pay off the loan faster or wait for the value of the property to go up or invest in yeah. the property through renovations and, and whatnot. So often cosmetic renovations are probably the fastest way to gain equity. And then the other one that I'm about to journey into is like granny flats and subdivisions and things like that as well. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And uh, buying your music background and, you know, your property investing journey, if you could describe your, your journey so far in property to one song, what would that song be? Oh, to one song. Oh, my goodness me. Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot with it. <laughs> that, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. Or a couple of songs. A couple of songs. Some Taylor Swift ones come to mind. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, look, I mean, oh, I, I was watching the other day Supernatural, the TV series, and they have such a great soundtrack on that one. Um, okay. I don't know. I'm trying to think. I can't think of a name at the top of my head. Um, but uh, look, oh, to, be honest, to be honest, a Taylor Swift album probably will describe my property journey. Okay, all different emotions, eh? Yes, yes, the whole kind of like life cycle of you know this is the nice happy days, this is the dark times, and then this is like the breakthrough where you come out at the end and realize have this massive realization of you know hang on a second, this is what I should have been doing when I first started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's cool. And I think with any growth, right? Like it's like, it doesn't matter you want to get big and look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever, like it, it, like you, it, a lot of people think, yeah, I want to have that, but they don't know what it takes to get there and they don't want to do what it takes to get there. And, you know, you go to the gym, you lift up weights or whatever, you rip your muscles and you've got to wait for it to repair. And people are like, oh, it's all too hard. And they don't go, go back and do it. Um, I think, yeah, as a property investor, a lot of people, you know, the minute, the minute they find a bit of adversity, they'll try and shy away from it or whatever. And it's a matter of pushing through and having that growth in that. Which is oh, absolutely. Fun. And that, that was the thing that I struggled mainly with was being able to go again and get um, lending because banks, as you know, even yeah. now will from month to month change their lending policy and it depends on a whole bunch of variables yeah. which change like the wind. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess that takes us on to the next thing that I really want to crack open and, and break apart. Uh, I think I know what you're about to say with this, but I, I'm really excited to hear how you've been able to, you know, use your knowledge of the law and your understanding of how the banks work to be able to unpack the strategy that's been able to help you continue even with the banks. You normally, most people would snooker themselves, but you found a way to break through the loopholes. So, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things I found out was when you take a loan out in your personal name, even if you have an asset that is attached to a loan and that asset is fully paying off the loan and all its expenses, the banks don't actually put it down on paper as that. They shade it 
down essentially yeah. they say oh, actually you know what yes your property might be turning over twenty five thousand dollars a year your expenses are thirteen thousand however we're going to make the expenses more like eighteen thousand and your income is now going to drop down to maybe twenty thousand so you're left with two k buffer essentially always sometimes even less um and the reason for that is obviously it's to do with the national credit code and the way the banks are regulated uh, when it comes to personal lending. So it's all around this whole notion of responsible lending. Um, so with that said, they always have to leave that buffer should interest rates go up or circumstances change, inflation, et cetera. If someone cannot pay off their mortgage, at least the asset will be able to cover all their costs. What I didn't realise initially but I now know is that if you use a whole bunch of corporate structures, whether it's companies or companies with a trust attached to it, um, whilst those entities still take on residential mortgages, the assessment criteria is different because the national credit code does not apply to company structures in the same way as does as personal structures. So what that means, um, and again, this could all change in the next couple of years um, after a recent high court case where the, this became a bit of a contentious issue, but ideally what happens is if you buy um, an asset producing, sorry, an income producing asset in a yeah. company structure, um, the banks then, yes, you, you personally have to guarantor the loan as a director, but the banks only care about how much is the asset making and how much is the asset then um, expensing. Um, and at the end of the day, if you happen to be positively geared or positive cash flow, then the banks go, great, we'll leave that asset alone. You go for another uh, loan in another structure and the banks go, okay, we'll give you money. We we don't care about that asset because it's self-sufficient. We don't have yeah. to worry about it, which is a strange thing because you try to do it in your personal name, yeah. but banks have to manage the risk in companies yeah. because the companies have a variety of structures to restructure or sell bits off or sell the whole company off at the end of the day, yeah. banks weigh the risk very differently. Yeah. It's just yeah. you've got to have the right team as well around you to be able to negotiate those deals with the banks for you at the end of the day. Yeah. Exactly. And, and how to ask for it as well. There's a different way. Like it's like some people like ask for things in a different way and it's, it's <laughs> understanding how you need to be and, how yeah. to take the hand and how to, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. So I guess, um, yeah, that's that's one thing that you've learned and, and overcome is, is how to keep progressing. Has there been any other sort of challenges that you've had that you've been able to face and overcome that adversity with? Like you said Renault's beforehand and stuff like that. Like, yeah, Renault's beforehand. The other thing is just, um, you know, staying on top of your income and tax returns. So whilst, you know, passive income is all great, um, particularly if you're leveraging debt, you still need to have the income to be able to service that debt at the end of the day. Um, so staying on top of things and the thing that's hit me recently, unfortunately, has been the hex debt, which uh, for the past couple of years haven't been really paying too much attention to pay off other than the bare minimum. Um, yeah. And now looking at that going, oh, crap, I need to find a way to get rid of this debt um, yeah. because it is not only affecting my serviceability, but it's a, it's a fair chunk of wasted money to be paying every year towards. Yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. And I guess, like, starting out, like, when you're buying a property, your first one is, like, expenses and things you've got to learn along the way and all that, and then you go to a second one and a third one, you grow in the position. What sort of, like, challenges have you been able to, you know, grow up so quickly and, like, manage the debt and manage the cash flow, like you said? Yeah. yeah, I mean, with the first one, it was just basically the rent and also the loan structure as well. So for investment properties, I do interest only loans. Um, and the reason for that is, well, I don't really need to pay down the principal if the principal is automatically increasing um, as is. Um, so I don't need to really pay down the loan to get more equity out of the property, essentially. Um, so that helps with cash flow um, yep. in a property perspective. Um, the other thing that I've yeah, just made sure that I was on top of is when you buy the property, actually do the figures. Yeah. Like get an Excel spreadsheet and go, okay, it's going to cost me two and a half grand in council rates. It's going to cost me, you know, uh, $1,000 in water rates. Um, if it's a unit, you've got to factor in strata costs as well. And then say, okay, if the mortgage is at, and I always did my calculations when I first started at around 6 7% as yep. the interest rate. 
Um, now I'll probably be doing it maybe eight, nine, ten, even percent, just yep. to see if I can break even. If I can break even at ten percent, I'll go okay. Yep, I'm fine with this deal. Yep. Let's go ahead with it. Um, so th- those are the things to be, you know, mindful of. The other thing is as well to, you know, when you do buy in certain areas, um, you know. I think knowledge is power. So, you know, making sure that you're buying in areas where you know you can get your property rented out at, yep. you know, a, whatever is the market rent um, yep. and get that return on investment. Um, the other thing that I also sh- struggled with in the beginning was actually having a good property manager <laughs> to manage my properties, especially well, in the towns. Yeah. Well, it's always the biggest hurdle. So, you know, one thing's about buying the asset. And the other part is like managing it to be able to extract the best return. And I've found over the years, some agents are pro-tenant and some are pro-landlord. You need someone who's going to be yeah. pro-landlord. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So I had I had one in a, in, when we first started. She was great initially, but then she ended up being pro-tenant to the f- point where she found a tenant, a larger house for the same amount of rent. And the tenant then left, but she also gave freedoms to the tenant to start like drilling holes and walls and all this other stuff which I had no knowledge about. Um, and the worst thing I hate is going to tribunal because, I mean, I've, I've been to the tribunal, I've been a tenant, I've been a landlord. Yep. When you go to tribunal as a tenant, you're like, oh, tribunals are in favour of the landlord. But as a landlord, when you go to tribunals, it's like, oh, they're in favour of the tenant, right? Yep. Um, and and at the end of the day, it really comes down to how well your property manager has actually documented Yep. the whole tenancy from the start, like those initial photos of the condition at the start, the photos at the end the, and the timing of when those photos are taken and then that correspondence with the tenant and how proactive they are. Um, it, yeah, so, you know, um, I was a bit peeved off with that particular um, yep. property manager and I was like, yep, next, you know. And, th- and that's the thing, you can't be emotional with, you know, property um, yeah. Because as soon as you're emotional and you're like, oh, well, they're a good tenant, et cetera, well, if they're paying $100 under market value, you've got to find a way. You've got two options. Okay, they're a good tenant. I know they pay the rental time. Let's increase them $20 a week. And they'll be fine with that. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you say, well, we're going to increase you $20 a week, and they're like, oh, we can't afford it, then you're like, okay, well, see you later because there's another 30, 50 people queuing just for your rental property. Yeah. And I think. You know, we all want Lamborghinis, we all want Ferraris, we want all the things in life, right? But, you know, the budget's there, right? And it's like yeah. it's not our job to support someone else's lifestyle. We're supporting it by giving them a property that's affordable, that's clean, neat, tidy and all that, um, which is very important. You, you mentioned beforehand, like, you know, don't let the emotion in. I always say you've got to treat your investing like a business and yes. you know, you're being a business person as well. Um, you need to make sure you're leaving that emotion out of the door because it, it will get you killed if you're too nice or, yeah. Well, absolutely. So I think as well, like when you're doing renovations in particular, sometimes you're like, oh, I want the state of the art kitchen. I want, you know, the state of the art bathroom. And you're like, you know what, a $500 kitchen from Bunnings, if you like get the nice finishes on the on the cabinetry, will look the same as a $2,000 kitchen, um, yeah. you know, and it's it's learning how to be smart. And like you said, you know, we all want nice things that was the other thing my younger self would say do not buy cars until you've bought houses um yeah. lesson, lesson learned there I think in a period of 10 years I bought four cars outright not, yeah. not smart with my spending um but yeah it's one of those things like with renovations and things like that you can't be emotional even when you go and buy a property I mean I bought a property in Queensland I bought it sight unseen other yeah. than a, a video walkthrough and I was like okay let's look at the figures it's standing all right the building pest says everything's fine it's a big block of land which is great because i want to you know either put a granny flat or knock down do like a duplex or triplex on it um did i care if there was a little bit of paint peeling off the wall no because the property manager that i did the walkthrough with was like you know what we can rent this out today for 500 dollars a week yeah and it was a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar purchase so it's a (laughs) no-brainer I think that's cool as well. Like, cause when you go to buy something, I think a lot of people fear when they're buying a property that's like interstate or not in the neighborhood. Like, for, when I first started investing, there was, um, you know, in Sydney, there was no internet. There was no, well, there was internet, but it wasn't used to like we are now. There's no podcast, no Facebook, no YouTube, yes. not even realestate.com existed. Yes. Um, 
and you know the only things that were out there were bulletin boards you could post a little message and maybe a week later someone would write back to you or whatever um, and now you can literally track a camera down the street and do google street view and you know, you've got all the tools and resources there um, uh, if, if someone was to buy a property and want to go and look at it, touch it, feel it. You can look at a property anywhere and say it's okay. You get the pest in the building, it's full of termites or whatever. Yeah. When you buy shares, right? I always ask people if they're buying shares, like, do you own Woolworths shares, for example? And someone will say, yeah, I own Woolworths shares. It's like, okay, great. Have you been to all 500 or 700 or 1,000 stores and made sure they'll look okay? I don't want to buy Woolworths shares because there's one in a dodgy neighborhood, right? And it's like, no, <laughs> you're looking at it. What's the cash flow? What's the numbers? How's it going to okay. stack up? Yeah, and I think it's cool that you've you know, done that on your, yeah, with, with your journey as well. So. Yeah, and that's the other thing. I mean, you got, and nowadays I probably buy with a little bit more data focus because, as you said, the internet, you have a lot more access to data and um etc and, uh, and I do like to think from an economics point of view when I assess properties now um but like when I first started I was just like I know this town here's the yeah. here's how much is worth this is how much the rent is yes there's a Woolworths yes there's a Bunnings up the road I'm yeah. sorted it's all good and there's you know construction coming in the next 10 years with major road developments I'll buy here that that yeah. was my thinking at the time now I'll probably factor in a few other different things like scarcity and just kind of, you know, how can I maximise the rental yield or how can I maximise the growth over the property over, say, five years to really rip out as much equity to go again. Um, yep. So my thinking has changed, but that comes also with education and, you know, the more you, you buy and the more you start to network with people that are on those similar paths to you. And and that was the other thing I found as well was um, when I first started, all of my friends were like, how can you be buying property? You know, it's like I have 60k sitting in the bank, but I'm not ready to buy property. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're ready. Just just put it down. Yeah, and that's the other thing in terms of being smart is with your loans that you get from the bank, go back to them and ask them, can I get a better rate when you yeah. can? Um, so recently I fixed on my loans, luckily at 2.85%, and that's until 2025. So I'm happy for the next yeah. year and a bit but also that allows me to kind of work on okay well if interest rates stay where they are or go higher can I still afford to pay the loan and for me it's like well the value of my property has gone up so I can always just refinance yeah back up to 80 and then you know extend the loan back to 30 years and then I'll be fine and I'll be probably pay, paying pretty much what I am today um, yeah. so that's that's the other thing to look at it is how can you refinance or how can you ask for a better rate and negotiate um with with banks and things like that yeah well and you, you mentioned i think it's a very big bump so a lot of people just think like they're stuck especially in the market now where you know interest rates have gone up they may not be able to service to take to a different bank or, or whatnot um it just might simply pick up the phone to the retention team at the bank you know you might be able to get a half percent or a quarter of a percent or three quarters of a percent yeah it all adds up Oh, and and especially if you have other accounts with that bank. So once you have multiple properties, let's say you have a couple properties with the one bank, you can start to negotiate lower rates because you have banks. If you have businesses as well, which I do, um, yeah. they start giving you nice rates because you have, you know, a whole bunch of accounts with that particular bank. Um, yeah. And then if a bank doesn't give you a good enough rate, you just take all your accounts to the next bank because they're going to give you a great deal better than your previous bank just to have your business at the end of the yeah. day. Rock warming. Also, yeah. also, the people don't look at that. They're like, oh, I had a gold mine account and I was at Google <laughs> and now I should stay with the CBA or I should stay with the Dragon or whatever. So, yeah. 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 Those, those money boxes really get people. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yes. Um, and you said um, a few times like about renovations and you said that you got a block of land that you could potentially subdivide and all that sort of stuff. Um, do you have like a, a specific like say your strategy moving forward, you've got a few properties now. What what like if we fast forward like five years, ten years, what does that strategy look like for you with what you're trying to achieve out of your portfolio? Like yeah. yeah, look, I want to keep, you know, investing in the residential property space. I might also have a couple commercial properties down the track because I think that's really good for cash flow, um, particularly at the moment with the economic climate. Um 
I mean, ideally, I would like to probably by the end of next year, if all goes to plan, try and buy between another five to ten more properties. Um, and with that said, I already got with the, the couple of properties I have, I'm already in the process of putting a granny flat on the back of one. That's going to cost me about 100K um, to build, but it's going to return me $450 a week in rent. Yeah. yeah. So... And plus the equity that then comes as a result of having that granite flat at the back of the property. So the property currently is now valued at 730000 Once I've actually put the granny flat on, it's going to be worth over a mil, probably closer to 1.1 mil. Okay, cool, cool. So, cool. yeah, there's – and that's kind of what I'm looking for in the deals is the growth potential, not just in terms of, okay, if I just sit on the property, let – you know, markets as they have been, you know, earn me 100K in equity just on the property alone. It's like, well, at some point that's going to stop um, yeah. or, or slow down. Um, so how can I, you know, um, create that growth? Um, so now I'm buying, you know, blocks of lands where the house might be at the front, but there's a big backyard. And I know I can put a 50 or 60 square uh, granny flat on there. Or if it's a land where, for instance, it's an older style house, maybe rent it out for five years, knock it down, rebuild put a duplex on you know and yeah. things like that yeah well have you done any big renos yet or you said you've done some renos not yet first? not yet so the granny flight is coming so that will be um the biggest one that i'm doing at the moment um yeah. and then probably the one in queensland in a couple of years time i either will knock it down completely and do a full-on um rebuild um of probably a two to three sort of townhouses um yeah. But yeah, that's that's kind of yeah where I'm going is you know playing with that that development space as well because what's quite interesting as well um, once you have enough equity you can also get construction loans and it makes your life a lot easier to just rebuild essentially. Yeah, cool, cool. And I guess like you, you said that you like there's things you would have done earlier if you could if you could go back to DeLorean back to you know ten years ago. <laughs> yes, yeah, change things. Um, uh, to get to where you are today has been a long game to, to to get there and you know now you've got knowledge you've got the resources you've got you know the processes and systems in place you can snowball that even faster um I, I guess for people that are watching that maybe like i can't do something today or i've been waiting or uh, they might have capacity but they don't feel like they can do something what's your thoughts on a long game like how's that like for you like remaining focused because you could have had people in the early days saying to you you shouldn't do this. You only need one property. Just buy one or whatever. And you could listen to that. Uh, well, I mean, start with the one property. When I first bought a property, I was like, yeah, I'll get one or two. Now it's like I want 10, 20, 40. You know what I mean? I don't want to stop because um, yeah. I want properties that can, you know, you know, make me a couple hundred K a year so I can actually go travel the world and, you know, support my family and things like that uh, down the track. Um so, it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for the lifestyle it can provide me, you know, down the track. Um, and, you know, with that, we, we all know money doesn't make you happy, but it does give you a lot better access to to certain things, um, we, which is kind of what I'm sort of striving for. Um, you know, as soon as you have that deposit, just go and buy property. If I had to choose between property and shares, I'd definitely do property in a heartbeat. Um, because you got both the cash flow and the growth, um, whereas with shares you're really just reliant on on the growth and I guess the dividends, which would be the cash flow side of things. But um, yeah, so I definitely would just go there if I don't have the deposit or the serviceability. Find someone that you can partner with um, yeah. for that first property um, and set it up in a way. This was the other thing that I learned when I did my first property with my brother, which I then had to buy him out. And then I had to, when I restructured everything, I had to pay stamp duty again. Terrible idea. But when you do buy with someone, structure it in a way so that essentially you have two mortgages, one for each person and based on, on the split of the property rather than one loan um, because then you become responsible for the whole of the debt, even though your split on, on title might be 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. Jointly and separately liable, which will connect. That's yeah. right. That's right. And yeah, so there are ways you can structure it. So, like I learned afterwards, for instance, Combank at the time had a thing called property share, where if you had two or more people on a title, 
each of them could have their own individual mortgage, which was not cross collateralized, um, which was was great. But I I'm not sure if they still offer that anymore. But um, at the time, that was something that we learned after <laughs> we had taken our our loan out with another bank. So yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. And I guess like. You know, someone if someone was to if you were to start again today, like you said there that you change a few things, is there anything that you'd like fast track to go? Okay, I can get I always say to people like there's a difference between getting one or two or getting ten or twenty properties. And you said before, you know, ten, twenty, it's if you added the extra zero on. Um, what would be your advice to someone if they were starting today? What would be the maybe the top couple of things? Yeah. I'd go I'd go and speak to a lawyer or uh, an accountant and talk about I don't want just one or two, I actually want 10 or 20. Um, because when I first started my property journey, my accountant was like, oh, that's fine. You've done it the right thing. Banks should lend to you. Your income's great. Everything's great. Reality was very, very different. Um, and then he had this thing where it's when you get to five properties, we can talk about structuring them and moving them across into these corporate entities. What I didn't realise at the time is that you have to pay stamp duty again and possibly capital gains tax as well which you don't want to pay because that ends up if you at five properties you're looking at a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars just to move it into a new entity which you don't really want to be doing um so in that case a lot of people often then sell and restart again um so getting the structure right and just knowing like do you just want one or two or what would you be comfortable with and what is realistic as well so for me, probably when I first started to say I wanted 10, probably wasn't realistic. But once I kind of realised, you know, actually, if I do it this particular way and, you know, I, I think long term over a 10 year period, then yes, 10, 20 properties is actually quite achievable. Um, but to do it, I need to structure it in a particular way. Yeah, I think, you know, reverse engineering the goal is very crucial when, you, when yeah. you've got the goal of like, what do I need to do to, to get there? And I think more people, like when they're investing, this is why a lot of people get stuck at one or two properties, is that they plan more for their next holiday, they plan more for their next, how they're going to spend their money, what they're going to do on the weekend, than what they are to exit their job and how to get financial freedom, which you know, is very crucial. Like you want to be either stuck in a job for 40 years or 50 years, or you're, you know, take that time, whether it be a day, a week, a month, a year, two years, to plan how am I going to get out and, you know, uh, uh, Absolutely. And the other thing that I, I know because of the structures is if you want that holiday, if you want to, you know, pay for your kids' dance lessons or whatever it is, you yeah. can do that actually in the structures. There's there's ways to do it where you yeah. can still have, you can still scale, you know, your property journey and, as you said, just snowball it um, and, and still have those holidays and trips. But it's all about having the right approach and the right structure. And yeah. once you understand that, and they don't really teach you this, you know, she, you, I sort of, I was fortunate to actually be working for uh, one of the big four accounting firms in their tax legal department. I won't say which one, yeah. um, but um, and and that's when I was seeing, you know, high net individuals exactly what was on their, um, what was, you know, how much money they were making per year, and I suddenly saw, okay, well. Person X who makes, you know, $5 million clear after tax actually has 10 income streams yeah. at least. And you're like, hmm, and none of them work 95 jobs. Yeah. Interesting. So when you start thinking about that and then you think, okay, well, what sort of income streams they have, majority of them are properties and a lot of these people have properties in corporate structures um, and then they go into other investments and commercial spaces and so forth. That's where they have that that income stream. Um, so understanding that took me even even for someone who actually had the law in front of them and it should have yeah. like popped when I was at law in my head at law school, which it didn't. Um, yeah. It wasn't until like I kind of actually saw the mechanisms working in real life for others that I kind of went, hmm, okay, I can do the same thing. Yeah. And, and as you said, treating property like a business is the way to do it. And then, of course, it all comes down to knowledge of, you know, understanding where is going to be the next hotspot, which no one really ever knows. But yeah. like you said, you know, those strategies to kind of um, create equity as well is a, a useful tool, particularly if you're if you haven't bought it necessarily in the right market. Um, 
you know, and so having those things up your sleeve and, you know, just being able to plan, like you said, and sit down and actually work it out. Okay, how can I, you know, maximize the value of this property or how can I maximize my income and actually find a way to do it rather than say, oh, it's too hard, it's not for me. Getting yeah. past that mental barrier that we put up on ourselves is the thing that will keep you moving forward. Yeah, yeah of course. And um, I think too often, like, people people just go, it's all too hard or it's, you know, it, it, you need to apply yourself to it and, and be committed and, and focus on it too. So, yeah. Well, that's true. And with everything in life, if we don't take that first step, we don't know what's actually going to go beyond that. And whilst it might seem a bit scary, at the end of the day, what's the worst that could happen? You buy the wrong property, you sell, you start again. Yeah. Uh, and I learned that from my parents who had property. They lost everything in the early 90s and then they had to rent for the rest of their lives. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, they were financially strained for most of their life. And I kind of went, I don't want that for myself. What can I learn from their mistakes to make sure I don't repeat them and do things differently? And, and one of my things that I always do is if there is a problem, I don't say, oh, okay, that's that's it. Okay, someone says no. i like, you've said no. How can we get to a yes? Yeah. You know, how can we make it happen? If it's yeah. not this path, it's going to be this path. If we have to go around the block to get there, then yeah. let's do it. But let, let's overcome that hurdle. And, yeah. yeah. I think the biggest thing when I, when I speak to my best sort of, daily basis when it's someone has a hurdle like they'll say oh the bank said i can't borrow it's like well why can't you borrow right and it's like oh i don't know and it's like people don't ask those questions to their broker or the bank why can't i borrow like what is it that's hurting you because if you don't know what it is that's hurting you then you can't go back and fix it so it's like well we've got a problem here what do i need to do to fix it is it you're servicing okay i can't service for it how much do i fail servicing by what do i need to do to overcome that and that's sort of well exactly so it might be you might get a second job on a Saturday for eight hours, but it's yeah. temporary. But if that gets yeah. you to service, then do yeah. that for six months, get the loan, yeah. and then you can quit the job afterwards. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah, and people don't people don't think that. They always think about, oh, I want everything the way I want it to be, which is all lifestyle-based, without yeah. actually thinking about if I make a small sacrifice, yeah. then I'll get somewhere. It, it's also the same thing I find with some young people. I mean, I've met some really great young people who have a fantastic work ethic where they just will work, you know, 16-hour days if they have to just to save that deposit. But then yeah. at the same time, because I, I do teach at, at, um, at a few universities, uh, one being Macquarie Uni, um, funnily enough, you get the odd student with the mindset that it's like, how dare I work more than eight hours in a day? And it's like, don't you want the overtime? <laughs> you know yeah, what you're going to be right. working that eight hours a day for a very long time by the time of things. So. Uh, yeah, and, and a lot of it's mindset. And you see it in students as well. Like even when you like when they do assignments, they're always looking for, oh, what's the, the path of least resistance rather than actually, you know what, if I just put all my effort just for a short period of time and get the benefit from that, then that's going to give me this opportunity and I can scale this way. Um, so a lot of people look for the easy way out and they're like, oh, well, it's too hard to save for a deposit. Instead, let me jump on, you know, Facebook and whinge about it. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, but, when, when they when they could take that second job or just work a couple hours extra and actually, you know, um, have have that deposit at the end of the day. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like I went, when, when I first started, like sometimes I share rent and things and that, but um, I used to work for two full-time jobs because I needed to earn income. I needed to service the debt. And it's like, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be where I'm now. But someone could walk in on the chapter now and say, oh, you're lucky or you're entitled or whatever. And it's like, no, it's the, I had to eat so much shit to be able to get here. And that's you know, part of the journey. Yeah, you'll, you'll get there. And you do need to put in the hard work initially. You do have to make, make sacrifices. I mean, some of my mates who have property portfolios, quite large ones, all of them made sacrifices. Most of them were working like 100, 120 hour weeks in those yeah. initial few years just to pay off the loans and actually, you know, be able to have equity to go again. Yeah. It's all the hustle. It's the hustle. <laughs> so. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, well, I, I really appreciate all your help today. And, of advice that they're giving you people and uh, discussion your journey um if people want to connect with you how would like they connect like you have a website or somewhere like yeah i have a website which is just monicarevelis.com um yep. alternatively you can find me on instagram facebook and linkedin um just search monica Rivellis or at monica Rivellis and i will appear
yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Monica. I appreciate that. And uh, to the community that have been watching, thanks a lot for tuning in today and uh, make sure you, you like it, share it with your friends and family, give us a like and uh, remember to subscribe. You can find us on Google Play, and Apple Play, Spotify and YouTube. We'll catch up soon and have a great week. Bye for now. Like the last Sam, man, we're stuck in the matrix. This my advice, don't care if you take it. The dollar back to die soon to be hyperinflated. This my two cents, don't care if you save it. Join be decentralized and you will see. You've been lied to the whole time, and it's the irony. Cause they do the exact opposite. You become a slave to the system. And up your money, all they do is profit. There's no conspiracy theory. You better hear me. Crypto will set you free before the system does. I don't care. If you do or you don't But what I'm saying is the truth to the reason you choke I've never been a failure Excuse my behavior Keep talking, haters doing me a favor And y'all tell the lies I know what they've been telling you I'm the opposite of Donald Trump of Australia It's amazing, been for the taking My time is never wasted Just can't waste it